this is the workshop you are in. <laughs> um, control F, simple verification skills for a complex information environment. Um, for your facilitators, I'll introduce Kelsey as well, who's helping with our tech, who doesn't have a photo. Kelsey, we need to get a photo of you for this slide. Um, but I'm here with Christina. My name is Jessica. I'm the Director of Digital Media Literacy Programming at Civics. Um, I've been working for the past number of years to help build um, tools and resources to help students evaluate information online more effectively. Christina? And I'm Christina Ganev. I'm the Director of Education for Civics, uh, previously a classroom teacher for 18 years and uh, someone who also worked to support uh, teachers teaching primarily Canadian history, but also law, civics, politics, social studies, and English. And I'm so pleased to join you today. So we are joining you from Takaranto, Toronto. And so our land acknowledgement will be based on where all, well, actually Kelsey is where you are, but uh, where Jessica and I are from. So uh, we acknowledge that we are hosted on the lands of the Mississaugas of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Wendat. We also recognize the enduring presence of all First Nations, Métis and Inuit peoples. And we at Civics are continue to ongoing learning to um, not only acknowledge the land, but also our responsibility as settlers uh, on this land and, and uh, the way in which it intersects with the work that we do. So Civics is a Canadian education charity dedicated to building the habits and skills of citizenship among youth. Uh, and we do this by creating experiential learning programs and curriculum materials for teachers. So you may be familiar with our signature program, Student Vote, where in the last election, which was a snap election, not a lot of time, as you know, nearly uh, 800,000 students voted in that election. We also have additional programs that support student learning in between elections, uh, such as student budget consultation, which focuses on financial literacy, elected representatives day, um, or sorry, um, focusing on connecting students with elected representatives called Rep Day, and teacher training through our democracy boot camp. The focus of our session today is on our program called Control F. Control F is a verification skills program that helps students evaluate online information. All right, thank you. I'm just going to um, pause the note here. Mark has posted in the chat that um, yeah. there is a scheduling issue. So this this session is now 1020 to 1105. So oh, I see. OK, we'll start. <laughs> we're starting now. I think uh, looks like some people are still joining us for anyone who's still joining us. Um, I'll just say all you missed was introductions from myself, Jessica, and Christina, and Kelsey. We are the Civics, a uh, civic um, education organization that runs a student vote program, among other things, including Control F, which is what we're here to talk about today, um, verification skills programming. So all you've missed, if you missed anything at all, was introductions. And uh, it looks like we're now at the scheduled, the real scheduled starting time. So I'll uh, we'll pick this up in progress. I'll pass this back to you, Christina. Okay, excellent. So um, we're, we're here to talk about informed citizenship today and how we evaluate the information that we see and hear online. So uh, Control F is built around this fundamental question of informed citizenship with so much information coming from so many different places. It can be hard to tell who's putting information out there and if it is reliable. Uh, there is clearly a lot of false and misleading information online, PR, junk news, and other low quality sources that are also abundant online. And we know that for democracy to work, citizens need to be informed and engaged. And this is why we built the Control F program, because we need better digital media literacy tools that support informed citizenship. The Control F program, named by Jessica, so I want to give her full credit for her fabulous name, is uh, named for the keyboard shortcut for find. This is a fast way to locate information on a page. Like that shortcut, Control F is based on the idea that there are simple steps anyone can take to understand online information. And our goals for today are threefold. We're going to learn about the tools and the materials that we can download and use in our classrooms. We can practice the skills and have a little bit of fun. And we'll review tips for the classroom at the end of this presentation. So Control F um, encourages students to understand the importance of being an informed citizen, citizen, care about what is true or credible, habitually evaluate sources and claims, and seek out information from reliable sources. All right, so we're going to start uh, with a warm up. This is something relatively light. Um, we have two images here of KFC products a KFC chicken donut sandwich and a video game console with a built in chicken warmer. Now, what I want you to do is decide if you think each of these is real or fake. 
Um, Kelsey is going to drop the link in chat in case you'd like to take a closer look at either of these posts. Um, and did we have a poll for this? Kelsey, we didn't actually test the polls, did we? All right. We did, we're, yeah. Yep, yeah, we're going to put up a poll. Um, and you're just going to, we're just going to ask you to indicate um, what you think. Which one's real? Which one's fake? Are they both real, both fake? Which one's which? Um, this is this example is part of what we provide for students, and it usually gets a pretty good reaction just because it's it's fun. Is the poll up? Kelsey? I can't see it because I'm co-host. Um, Christina, are you also co-host? Uh, let me see. I can't see it either. No, I can't no, see it. Poll. Okay, let's use chat. Let's just use chat. Just chat. Plan. We're not going to poll. Um, just say in chat whether you think one is real and one is fake, both are real or both are fake, and feel free to indicate which one you think is is real and which one is not real. Both real. Somebody's answered. Anyone? Both fake. All right, good. I love it. Already we have controversies. <laughs> <laughs> That's my answers, both fake, both fake. Yeah. Um, game console is fake. Left is real, right is not. Okay, we've got a real range of responses. I think we've covered the whole gamut of all the possibilities for what these are. Both fake, I hope. Yeah, I hear you, Trisha. That <laughs> was my response too. <laughs> um, so I'm going to go ahead and do the big reveal. So the chicken, so the chicken sandwich um, is real and the video game console is also real. <laughs> yeah, it was the video game console that really threw me in. I uh, I was surprised by that one. Um, you know, it's a it's, <laughs> right. I know it's a it's a pretty silly example, and it probably doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things if these are real or fake. But really, we can imagine people using their critical thinking skills to try to logic out whether these images are likely to be real or fake. Um, and we can imagine students staring at the photo to see if the words are photoshopped onto the sign or doing all these things, but it really isn't the best way to figure out the answer. I see there's still active chat. I love this. Um, what we want to do to know for sure is to get off the page and find out, is it real? Is it fake? Rather than, um, rather than guessing or using our instincts. So I'm going to, yeah, all right. I'm going to uh, show you a video. Um, this is really about where we get information, our information from uh, mattering. It's from our key collaborator, Mike Caulfield, who's a digital literacy expert who works at uh, University of Washington Center for an Informed Public, and he sums up the importance of finding key concept, context um, really well. So here we go. So I want to tell you a story. I'm calling it the parable of the lake. That sounds entirely self-important, but but trust me, uh, there is uh, there is a there is a point to this. So let's imagine someone. Let's call her Jill. Apologies to anybody whose name is Jill. Jill is walking along a beach or jogging. She sees uh, in the lake. She sees a bottle. In the bottle, there's a note. So she runs out into the waves. I don't know why. She runs out in the waves. She pulls out that note, and the note says, "N95 masks don't stop COVID." Right? They don't stop COVID-19. And she's no dummy, so she starts to she starts to examine this document and she sees it's written by an NMD. They're from the University of Upper Ohio. Uh, there's lots of footnotes uh, in in the uh, article. And there's data, there's data, lots of numbers, uh, lots of evidence. Uh, in this uh, in this document, and she also applies uh, critical thinking in terms of looking for logical fallacies, trying to follow the argument. And the argument here is pretty rock solid. It says that the mask weave of an N95 mask is 0.3 microns. Coronavirus is 0.1 microns, which means that the coronavirus is going to sail through that N95 mask like a marble through a chain link fence, right? I mean. You can just do the math, right? So she runs to her friend, Greg, and she says, hey, uh, Greg, I got, I got bad news. N95 masks don't work against COVID. Um, the weave is too loose uh, and the, the virus is too small and we've all been lied to. And Greg says, uh, that's shocking. Where did you find this out? And Jill says, uh, well, I, I, I found it uh, on a note, you know, in a bottle floating in a lake. Okay, okay, says Greg, but how, if that's the case, how do you know whether this is trustworthy? Jill says, you know, I'm no dummy. I, 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 used, the, uh, I used the power of critical thinking. So I, I went and I looked and I, I saw like 
who wrote this and they, they're an NMD, right? I looked at all the footnotes, right? And there's, ton, there's a ton of footnotes, which, which is very authoritative. There's data in it, there's numbers, there's charts. And I ultimately followed the train of the argument. I followed, I followed the argument and, and it looks like the argument makes sense. You can sort of just do the math here yourself. Greg says, all of this is fine, but there's a, there's a problem here, right? You, you, you jumped into critical thinking, which is, which is something, which great, is something that you want to do, but it's really the second step, right? Before you engage in critical thinking, what you have to do is you have to gather critical context. All right, so uh, where we find, when we find information online, instead of stopping to ask who wrote this, where did it come from, or what other sources say about it, we tend to read closely before even knowing what we're looking at. Um, that's kind of what Mike is saying. So traditional critical uh, thinking skills are still really important, but there's an order of operations. Before we start analyzing something, we need to gather some context. Um, we also want to make sure that we're using the right skills to help us know if something is credible. So the best way to find this context is by uh, reading laterally. So lateral reading simply refers to the act of leaving the page information is on to investigate the source or claim rather than looking for clues in the content itself. When most people try to assess information, they read vertically and apply close reading skills. This means they analyze the content to decide if the information seems credible. They look at the about page, check to see if the URL is .org or .com, they look for typos, and determine whether the site looks professional. So these close reading strategies are frequently packaged into checklists for students, including the popular crap test. But what we, what we know is that these, these strategies too often fail students when they're applied to online information. Check the Checklist techniques have been proven to leave students vulnerable to trusting faulty information, as well as to dismissing reliable sources for the wrong reasons. And I'm going to pass this back to Christina. To talk okay, thank you. So what does lateral reading mean in the context of the Control F program? Control F is divided into three key lateral reading strategies, investigate the source, check the claim, and trace the information. These strategies are packaged into an engaging, accessible set of classroom activities. And these activities center on short, expert-led educational videos supported by hands-on practice for students to evaluate information from both reliable and unreliable sources. This is what the website looks like where you can find these sources. We'll put these web addresses up again at the end of this presentation. The first lesson in the program is Why Verify? This provides an overview of the problem of information pollution. Here, students become familiar with the distinction between mis- and disinformation and the ways this content spreads. Lateral versus vertical reading is also introduced and students complete activities that help them recognize the limitations of their existing source evaluation skills. We're going to just jump right into trying some lateral reading together. So get ready to practice. The first of the key, the three key strategies is investigate the source. The educational activities in this section explore the different kinds of people and groups that produce content and their motives for doing so. Here, students start to practice lateral reading skills by using the internet to search, research sources to learn about their reputation. The fundamental skill for this section is to look up unknown sources on Wikipedia. So we do know that there's still a lot of hesitancy around Wikipedia and many students uh, tell us that they have been told not to use it, but it's really a useful resource to gain your bearings and to help you decide whether a source is worth engaging with further. This is what professional fact checkers actually do to find quick answers about unfamiliar people and groups. So let's say you come across the article on a site called Natural News saying that a new study shows that the sun has more to do with global warming than carbon dioxide. There is a fast way to access Wikipedia that we call the Wikipedia trick. What you do here is just strip off all of the website address except for the root URL, get rid of it, including the slash at the end, add a space and type in the word Wikipedia. And when you enter it, when you hit enter, it floats the Wikipedia entry if there is one to the top of your search results. And this is just a shortcut. You can also type the name of the site and the word Wikipedia into your search engine, the standard way to do the same thing. Here we find we don't even need to click onto the Wikipedia article if we don't want to.
sorry, just one moment. So everything we need to know is right there in the preview snippet. Natural News is a far-right anti-vaccine conspiracy theory and fake news website known for promoting pseudoscience and far-right extremism. If you'd like to learn about global warming, this is probably not the site you want to get that information from. One thing that is important to note is that we don't have to take Wikipedia's word for it. All claims on Wikipedia should be sourced. So if you want to know more about how the editors drew this conclusion, you just need to follow the citations. Some people will get tripped up on these kind of sites because not everything they publish is false. Often it's a mix of factual and non-factual information. But really, no matter what the story is about or what our own views are, we are best off finding a more reliable source here so we don't have to worry that there's a conspiracy or fabrication mixed in with the information we're reading. So we're going to do practice with a more complicated example. Let's imagine that you have recently adopted a plant-based diet and your friend sends you a link to a website saying that it questions the health value of plant-based meat. Take a few minutes to investigate the site using Wikipedia and then respond to this chat in, this, in the chat. Is this a good source for health-related information about plant-based meat? And Kelsey, did you put that in the question? Okay, yes, thank you very much. Excellent. We have some good students here who studied yesterday and came back. So <laughs> I know we'll get some good answers here. Yeah. Yeah, this one is common to the root found on Wikipedia. So there is a, a trick to this one. It's complex and that the organization name is different than what uh, yes, that's the tip. Um, the name of the organization. Oh, 404 on the website. Okay. AstroTurfing. <laughs> Someone found it. <laughs> Great. Okay, good. Some sleuthing. Keep going. If someone wants to drop the link to the Wikipedia article into the chat too, I think it's fine. Yeah, that's fine too. Yeah. You can help here. There you go. Okay, thank you, Daisy. Ding, ding. <laughs> okay, so everyone else, I'll give you a minute if you want to check that out. Okay, so as you're taking a look, um, you will see some, some points about the post is that there is uh, certainly a conflict of interest here and that this has been uh, funded by a, a lobby group. The site has a very specific agenda and the agenda is to lobby on behalf of the organization's client and certainly not to inform consumers. Um, and the person behind it is Richard Berman, who is an evil lobbyist lawyer we like to call, who is probably not presenting facts in the most balanced way because of his ulterior motives. So what we know is we don't need to go too deep. A few signs are enough. We're not building a legal case against this site. We don't have time. We just want to know whether it's worth our time. And remember, there are so many other sources of information out there. So the easiest thing we can do now is to move on when we see red flags like this. Um, again, it's very possible that some of what is on this site is factually correct, but we're better off getting our information elsewhere from a source that is more investigate, invested in informing us than persuading us. Thank you for that. Jessica, I will pass this off to you. Hey, that was a trick to talk everybody because we start off with a, with a tough one. Um, so the next strategy is uh, check the claim. And this one is helpful when the source doesn't have a Wikipedia page or when you hear a rumor or see something on social media that doesn't have a link to the original source. So in this section, we look at different types of claims um, and practice verifying them by doing keyword searches. 
So here we want to know if the claim is being reported by other sources or if it has been fact checked. Um, I'm going to share an example. Um, if something goes viral, there's a good chance it will have been investigated by reliable sources, um, fact checking groups or professional news organizations. So this is a TikTok video that went viral and it claims that teachers have secret functions um, that allow them to hear students on Zoom even when the students are on mute. So I'm just going to play this for you. Good morning. Are we still working on the questions for Hamlet today? Yes, we're going to be doing that today. Okay, and again, how can you even hear me in the first place? Okay, class, we're going to get started. So let's open up to page 216 in your book. All right, so that's just a, an example of something that circulated. And in order to you know find out if it's correct, we can do a keyword search. So um, if you te if you uh, search teacher Zoom mute TikTok, you might not even need all of those words, but some kind of you know, combination of the keywords. The first entry that we see is from Snopes, which is a known reliable fact checking group. Um, Snopes has rated this claim false, and you can read the write-up if you want to learn more about the claim and how Snopes determined its rating. You don't have to take Snopes' word for it necessarily. You can see how it arrived at, at its answer. Um, the other thing to point out about uh, doing the keyword searches is we don't want to bias our keyword searches, so it's good to make them as neutral as possible with only the keywords. Like, for instance, if you add the word hoax to something, you might only find information that says it's a hoax. I mean, if you Google COVID hoax, like, you know what you're going to find, right? So we don't want to do that um, when we're doing these searches. Just keep things as neutral as possible. So we're going to do another um, practice. So Kelsey will drop this the link to this one into the chat also. And once again, we want you to take a couple minutes to look into this claim and come back and let us know if you think that NASA really did outfit seals with hats to monitor climate change, as this, this tweet tells us also. Whether or not we decide this is true or false or the image is photoshopped or not, all, you can all enjoy this picture of a seal wearing a hat because it's a seal of a hat. So just take a couple minutes. And again, just respond in chat when you have some information about this. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Holly. <laughs> awesome. This one's easier than the last one, so don't be afraid to try it. <laughs> it's time to update the presentation. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> Reverse order. <clears throat> These are all examples that are in the materials, too. So we're going to be releasing updated materials, so that will come with updated examples. But um, we like for you to work with the examples that you'll be working with the students as well. The suspense is killing me. Is it a seal wearing a hat to fight climate change? <laughs> Somebody, <can't> anybody. <laughs> this one took a while last time, so we may need to give another minute. Oh, no rush. I'm just excited for the. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Daisy. Thanks, Daisy. It's real? Question mark. <laughs> There's another one. Real found on the NASA site. NASA agrees. He seems so happy. <laughs> <laughs> right? He's doing a good job. That's an important job that Seal is doing. That looks like my dog's face when we're holding a piece of bread up, you know. So he's a lab, so if you have a lab, you know what I'm talking about. But yeah, we see a link to the Smithsonian Bank site, which is reliable. We've gone right to the source. We've gone to NASA, you know, and NASA has said um, that it's real. So I think we can we can accept that it is real. That is a seal with an important job of wearing a metal hat. <laughs> I know, but really, um, he's very cute. I really just enjoy this example because I like looking at this, this seal. Um, I'm gonna move us along to the next uh, skill, which is trace the information. So we call this one the broken telephone skill because we know that images, quotes, and claims can get distorted and taken out of context as they circulate online. So this strategy is about getting as close as possible to the original source as we can. And the skills in this section include clicking on an attribution like an article, using the find command to quickly find relevant package passages, as control F is named after that one, um, and using reverse searching an image to see where it's been used. So these techniques are useful when making sure the framing of a story matches what the person posting the information says. Often we see instances of false context where a photo is, is a real photo is posted with a story that is misleading about what is taking place in the photo. So um, that's a, a key way that misinformation spreads and good to be able to do this tracing. 
So here's an example. This is another one from the student facing control F materials. Um, this post circulates a lot during elections in particular. It's a quote attributed to Justin Trudeau saying that he doesn't read newspapers or follow the news. If something important happens, someone will tell him. So we ask students to investigate this quote um, to find out, first of all, if it's true, and if it is, if there's any context that should be considered in interpreting it. So give it a try. Um, can you, again, we're, I think this is our last, last example, last uh, sleuthing skills, but do some searching and determine, first of all, did Justin Trudeau, Trudeau say this? I'll leave you to try that out and report back in the chat and there's any information. So we could drop the whole quote in chat, but I guess we're going to make you work for it, typing in the keywords yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you can't just take a whole quote and drop it into Google, or you can pull the keywords. You know, sometimes it takes a couple of tries. It doesn't always, the first thing you try doesn't always work. So it's worth, you know, if you do a keyword search and you're like, oh, I'm not getting what I'm looking for, you can add more keywords or just take, you know, take the whole thing. Um, just a good thing to keep in mind that, you know, if, if at first you don't succeed. And the same is true of the skills themselves. You know, um, sometimes you might do one kind of, search and you don't get the result and then you know you try again um you know we see students will get stuck well sometimes you're like oh there's no wikipedia and then just stop it's like oh no that's when you move on to the claim the claim search like if you can't find the source then you can start doing uh doing check verification of the claims themselves oh and we've got a link to an article from the globe and mail so if anybody wants to mention um if there's key context, so I'm just going to spoil it and say that, yeah, he did say this. That's what that link will tell us. There you go. And there's the key concept context right there um, that the quote is 20 years old. So this is kind of a fun one or an interesting one in that um, people might disagree on whether it matters. So we'll, you'll have some people be, you know, suggest that, you know, a politician um, should never say something like this, that informed citizenship is important, even when you're, if you're, you know, in your twenties and you're a drama teacher, um, others will be like, oh, give him a break. It was a long time ago. You know, is it important? Like, should our politicians be held to a higher standard than what this quote represents? Does it matter um, that he said this 20 years ago? Uh, so that in itself can kind of become, you know, become a good, a good, uh, a good topic of discussion. So I don't know if anybody wants to weigh in with personal opinions, you feel free to do that. <laughs> um, Someone always does. <laughs> um, some people are like, I don't want to be measured by what I said 20 years ago. And yeah, yeah. <laughs> it is <It's> a good thing. <laughs> Hard to argue with that one <laughs> um, in a nonpartisan way, obviously. <laughs> uh, these are all facts we're talking about. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> so um, I'm just showing you here. This is the format of the activity. So this this example does um, come in our materials. Uh, this is a Google form. Um, you're in BC, so you'll probably be using the Microsoft form as we provide both um, that guide students through the uh, investigation. So basically, they do the same thing that you just did. Um, you know, piece out into questions, and then at the end, it does a walkthrough. So it shows how you could solve it. Um, one way to solve it again, there's often more than one way, but it does show students that um, how they might go about it. Um, and there are plenty of examples like this for each of the skills. So Christina's going to say more about the resources in a minute, but I just wanted to tell you something about the research study we've just completed um, into the efficacy of the Control F program overall. So we just finished a fairly substantial study, um, which was carried out over the last school year to measure the impact of the Control F program as well as to get a better understanding of what skills students have now, what the baseline is, what they're bringing to the table. So we had more than a thousand students from across the country complete assessments before and after going through Control F. Um, these assessments ask, ask students to evaluate four different sources and claims um, to give them a trust score and to explain their answers. So we coded the answers according to strategies they, that they used in order to understand what they did. So first, the bad news which is that um, the baseline results were not great. Uh, they showed that Canadian students really do struggle to evaluate um, information. We suspected as much um, because foundational research out of the US suggested so, but I know we like to think that maybe our students are better, but in fact, what we saw was that the answers were functionally the same. Um, so on pretest, they relied really heavily on vertical reading strategies. This included looking at the website's appearance, checking if the information itself is relevant, noting superficial authority, authority signals, such as the presence of contact information or testing the information against personal instinct to see if that sounds right. Um, we saw that 79% of students read vertically, analyzing the site or post itself to reach conclusions. 
And then we also saw that these strategies continually led students astray. So for example, only 6% were able to identify the agenda behind an advocacy group's website in their answer. Um, the good news, however, is that we saw a real positive impact from the control F instruction. So there are some great results in here. Students' use of lateral reading went from 11% um, on pretest to 59% on post-test, which is a huge gain. Um, we did also see evidence that lateral reading helps students make sense of sources and claims. On pretest, just 9% of students said a meaningful context in their answer. On post-test, this number jumped to 50%. So a lot more um, relevant information being cited in the, in the rationales for the, the trust scores. So the accuracy um, also improved on post-test of all the students who used a lateral reading strategy, who looked something up, 85% correctly determined if a source or claim was reliable or not. You know, there are some bad lateral reads in there, people just like Googling something random, but um, overall, if you leave the page and you look something up in the context of this research, that's 85% getting it correct just by doing that, which is pretty great. Um, I want to show you an example of student responses. Um, oh, I see a question, like, is it in the... It's not, okay. I see a question in the chat about whether the behavior changes are sustained over time, and I'm gonna just pause and answer it because I do have an answer. Um, we did a subset of the group. We had um, a little over 1,000 students go through and do a delayed post-test. So this was given um, six weeks after the end of the Control F curriculum. Uh, not everyone was able to do it. It was, you know, we carried this out during COVID. So obviously things were a bit nutty and people were on quadmasters and everything else, but we did have a good, a good number of students go through. Six weeks later, we saw no, um, no erosion at all. So it was 60% from that group, it was 60% on the post-test and then 60% on the delayed post-test. So these thousand students took two post-tests. Um, and yeah, we saw the exact same six weeks later, which was exciting. Like, I think we were all hoping that it would be good, but it was maybe even better than we, uh, better than we thought, same, same. Um, so this here on the screen now is a pair of responses um, to one of the assessment examples, this one asks students to investigate the website of an advocacy group with a particular agenda. So on pretest, they were asked to look at the American College of Pediatricians, which was founded to pro protest the adoption of children by same-sex couples. So on post-test, they looked at the Heartland Institute, which is leading climate change denial group. Um, I will say that we're not evaluating students' belief systems here. We just want them to be able to identify the agenda that these organizations have. And here we see, um, a difference in the quality of the answers between pre and post tests. These are both from the same student. So for the American College of Pediatricians, the anti-LGBT group, um, they say the website is cluttered with advertisements, there's contact information, they have stated their objectives. So this one along with the high trust score, you know, does the student, is there, are their values aligned with the, you know, this group? Who knows, can't say. Um, for Heartland, the quote is, at first it seemed like the site was reliable, but after reading the Wikipedia site for a bit, I found out that they are a leading promoter of climate change denial, and there's a low trust score now. So this student has learned to go from looking for clues on the page itself to leaving the page and finding um, key context. So we saw a lot of this, which is exactly what we were hoping to see, and you know we find it really encouraging. So I'm going to pass that back to Christina again to talk about the resources. Excellent. Um, so I don't know, yeah, on my screen, I have it sort of cut off. I hope everyone can see uh, the top of that there that we have um, three columns here and the title for the first one is free with registration um, and I also actually wanted to address um, Tom's question so obviously this is anecdotal and just based on my own class but I saw the exact same uh, academic results research results in my own classroom um, when I piloted the control F for the entire program with my grade 10 Canadian history class and um, weeks and months later they had retained the skills and were applying them in our study of other topics and other research so um, I'm definitely a huge fan because I saw it work in front of my eyes and to see it validated with the research is uh, really quite fulfilling. Um, but here in the first column, we have free with registration. So uh, what it is, is a program for grades seven to 12. Uh, it takes about seven hours of class time. It took me exactly seven hours. Uh, there are lesson plans, slide decks and assessments in multiple formats, either for Microsoft as Jessica mentioned for your jurisdiction or for Google for those who use it and definitely flexible for remote and blended learning, which was the situation I was in. So I'd use this in the classroom with students physically in front of me, students uh, strictly online and also back and forth with various lockdowns. Uh, so we have them also offered in English and French. We have the expert led videos. You saw the one with uh, Mike, uh, but also Jane here and the students really enjoyed these videos. They're short, they're interesting and uh, they really are effective in teaching the skill. And then we have step-by-step -step practice for the students. 
Okay, so in terms of subject applications, as I mentioned, I have taught uh, a variety of different subjects over my career, and I would use uh, this program in any of them. I used it in Canadian history, but um, my spouse uh, used it in math and business, and I have colleagues who have used it across these subject areas, so social science, English, mathematics, science, civics, and history. Um, this is image in the center, that box, is what it looked like in my own Google Classroom, so uh, whatever platform you're using, there's D2L, Brightspace, et cetera. Um, this is how I sort of set it up as modules and just have some instructions there for students to do it in order. And then I asked my students in a survey after just for myself about what they had learned. And so I pulled a few quotes. I did not edit for grammar and spelling. So uh, at the bottom, I learned a lot today. I learned what misinformation is and why it's caused. I learned what, in, what information is and why that's caused. And I also learned what to do if you hear something that sounds wrong and how to see if it's actually fake or real news. So I thought that was very compelling on the right-hand side. Also, I learned not to be fooled by articles. And if I feel like it's true, I should do more research about it. And that research should be those habits that are really um, very quick, as opposed to studying the page. Uh, the student below noted, I learned to check if the news is real before sharing it with others, which is another different kind of comment of sharing, um, which I thought was, was very interesting. So moving on to our next slide here, how to register, very easy. You just click on the registration button on the website uh, that you can note there. You can take a screenshot right now. You can go to the site right now as some teachers are, are apt to do as we're speaking, um, or you can, you can email us afterwards. This is also being recorded and these slides will be shared with you. But if you go to this website and you click on register, you just enter um, a few details about yourself and you will have access to all of the files that you can download. And if you have any questions, we are happy to help. So uh, if you'd like anything from the teacher perspective, someone who has piloted it, it's uh, Christina at civics.ca. Uh, Jessica developed the program along with our colleague, Dimitri. So you can email Jessica or both of us. We'd be both uh, happy to support in any way and answer any questions uh, later or now. So we'll uh, open it up to the chat or to any questions. Uh, hello. Hello. Hi, I would like to ask one question. Um, the more recent example is the uh, uh, general, uh, American uh, former general, Colin Powell. He died of the COVID-19 uh, complication. He got full dose, he got uh, vaccination two, two times. So how do you deal with um, poor information? Somebody who put in that information, that true information, but they omit, that is a very rare example. So it's partially true, but it uh, omit the, the, the information that very few people who fully vaccinated die from COVID. Yeah, we see a lot of that where, where and this is a good point to be mindful of in general, you know, even we looked at that natural news site um, and we got away from it pretty fast because we decided that it was, you know, not a reliable source of information about the topic, but you will see even on sites like that, true information. So often this stuff comes to us in a mix. So really, this is where the key context becomes important. Again, you know, if you see, oh, Colin Powell died from COVID because of X, Y, and Z reasons, like this is where we kind of bring our, you know, bring our, our lateral reading skills in and find the most reliable source that we can. It's always about training up to a better source. We want to leave the page where the information is. So whoever is making this claim, you want to like leave that environment, do your searching, and it can take some, you know, it can take a few tries. Um, and find what you what you believe to be the most high quality information that you can. So like look for the, the source with the best reputation and get your information from there, which is not to say that, you know, um, newspapers and this kind of thing don't make mistakes, but we know that there are organizations that have standards where other ones don't. So, you know, if something appears in the, in the Globe and Mail, odds are it is accurate, the best of, you know, their ability to make it accurate. And, you know, if there is a mistake, a correction will be issued we can take issue with all kinds of things about this article itself and who was you know, interviewed and what the headline says, which is, is fine. That's kind of more general media literacy, which is super important. But before we do that, you know, we can look at these organizations, whether they're um, you know, health organizations, whether they're fact-checking groups, whether they're professional media sources, um, and find our facts there if we're just looking for the facts. So I would just encourage um, you to work with students to find out um, more information, like, but without, you know, going, as Christina mentioned, without going too deep, there's a, there's, we can kind of go the other direction where, you know, you can kind of, you can, you can research too much. And then, you know, then you start finding conspiracy theories because you're like, oh, there's this and there's that, and there's this and there's that. But these skills are really just about kind of like quick answers to like, is this accurate? Is there something that I'm missing? Right? Like we saw in the Trudeau example, it's like, okay, yeah, he said it, but 
there's a piece of key context that we want there. I mean, same with Colin Powell, right? Like you might say part of it is true. And then, you, you know, the question that you're asking is like, am I missing something here? And then you go to, you know, these reliable sources or these sources that are in the business of producing kind of verified information in order to, to check that claim against them. I hope that that was a long answer. I hope it was helpful. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, and Jessica, there's a question from Catherine, updated photos, examples. When is that coming out? I think we were referring just to pres the presentation, right? <laughs> For now. Updated. So Catherine said, you mentioned updated photos and examples, et cetera. Yeah. For, yeah, for control F. So basically the, the materials that are up now are the same ones that we um, developed and released last September. So we are working currently on um, some of them will remain the same because they just work really well for instructing a particular skill. But we do want to keep it current. One of the, you know, we worked with a lot of teachers over the last year. And one of the um, something that we heard over and over again was that the students and the teachers enjoyed how current and fresh the examples were. So it makes it feel relevant. So we just want to make sure that we are keeping everything kind of like fresh and up to date. So, you know, within the next I, you know, within the next month, probably we'll have, we'll have fresh examples up. I think we probably want to have them up already, but we're, uh, we're working on it. Um, and, and Nancy, you wanted to watch the entire recording. I think it's going to be posted on the conference site. That's what we heard earlier. Yeah. And then there was a question about timing. Um, can you, can you shorten it? Um, we do, we get this question every time, especially near the end. And I always have to weigh in as a teacher who ran this. Um, I see it and I'll just say it very quickly. I see this as an investment in the rest of your class. So I would try to do this early on if possible. Obviously, if you're here now in the presentation, you've started your class, do it. But I highly recommend doing the entire um, seven hours. It's really worth the investment because you will see it come back in dividends in, in terms of how your students engage with the rest of your course and materials, especially if you're doing inquiry-based learning that requires them to go off and do their own research, um, whether it's historical documents or contemporary research. Uh, it, these skills really do stick with the students and it will take them forward throughout their uh, entire academic career. So please do the whole thing if you can. <laughs> the repeated practice is really helpful. And uh, yeah, I love this question from Holly. How do I do lateral reading about control F? It's an excellent question. Um, <laughs> you know that civics doesn't have a Wikipedia? Maybe I'll just make this announcement. If anybody wants to create a Wikipedia entry for civics, please go ahead and do that because we can't as uh, employees of civics, but we are a reputable organization that have been around for 20 years and run well-loved programs across the country. So I think we deserve one, but it doesn't yet exist. I would say ordinarily that would be the, the best way. We are releasing a report. So those, those research results that I shared, those are going to be you know available in a report. Um, shortly, we worked with uh, academic researchers, we worked with the Stanford History Education Group, and we worked with um, lateral reading researchers out of City University of New York. So, you know, when that report comes out, you can be like, oh, they control left, worked with these credible people. So maybe, you know, like you can do, you can uh, research the, the related people and, and see what kind of inferences you want to make about credibility based on that. But yeah, it's a, it's a good question. In this moment, you have to just, you know, decide that civic is credible. <laughs> We, we also work with all those teachers across the country, as you saw on those maps. So that also, for me, lends a lot of credibility that teachers were asked from inception, um, you know, right up to until very recently to participate in all parts of the development of this program. So just as a teacher who was there from the very, very, very beginning when Jessica showed up to my, like my classroom and other classrooms and asked, you know, all kinds of questions, I didn't know where it was leading. Um, and just being able to see it along the way and provide input as, as an educator. And then you see the final product and you see that all kinds of other educators across the country in every jurisdiction has contributed to this uh, program that's um, sort of human uh, resource lateral reading. <laughs> I know how it's it already, but uh, I know. <laughs> <She's> <laughs> asking a bit. Because <laughs> it, uh, it, does, it does come up and it reminds me that we don't have a Wikipedia, so <laughs> we've got to get on that somehow. <laughs> Thank you for the context, Christina. Thank you. Uh, sure. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hi. Uh, may I ask another question? Um, for control F, uh, is it an euphemism or does it have other meaning? Control F? Yes, yeah, sorry. And I, if I didn't say it, um, control F is the keyboard shortcut for find. So if you're on a website, say, or in a document and you want to find, if you're looking for Trudeau, like if we're looking for that Trudeau quote, um, say you open an article and you, you can do command F and type Trudeau and it'll bring you right to the part of the article that has that word in it. So it's just a fast way to find information. It's it's very helpful if you're looking for a specific thing in a long document or a page, a big page of text. 
So essentially the Control F program is designed to help students and everyone um, find key context quickly, to find information quickly. So it's named for that keyboard shortcut kind of because it does a similar thing. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any last questions, words? I just want to thank you so much. Uh, when I read about the Stanford Education Group's work when I was doing my library diploma, I understood more about lateral research. And I just think this is just so important right now. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we were the same when we found the Stanford Tester Education Group stuff. It's like, okay, this is very important. And, you know, when we were at the beginning trying to decide what we should tackle and how, it was very influential. So we, you know, we took the, their, their research as the foundations for this program. And, and yeah. It's yeah, and, and and Wendy, my students also, you know, to have 15 year olds say that as well, right? To recognize the importance of this program. And um, so many were so grateful for the opportunity to go through the program and went home. And something we haven't spoken about is uh, the impact on parents, families, community, because a lot of my students went home and I know a lot of the students who participated in the program and continue to do so, uh, go home and speak to, you know, older people in their households, especially, uh, you know, another generation. So grandparents in particular, and we know that people over 60, you know, tend to share um, this type of information as well, more so than other groups. Not that teenagers don't, certainly, certainly they do as well, but a lot of the students would come back and tell me about conversations that they would have with their families and communities. So very important. And this is responding to that, right? It's a, it's a solution to a, one piece of the solution to many of our societal ails. Yeah, yeah. I see yeah. a about the funding. Um, the Control F project was funded primarily by the Department of Canadian Heritage through the Digital Citizen Initiative. So that's our, our primary funder on this. We're, we're a, a combination of government and private foundations um, family foundations overall and public and the public we accept donations also there's a <laughs> there's a charity Canada helps page civics page so we, we do individual donations as well not not hinting but not not hinting what a nice thing to say Nancy thank you <laughs> awesome yeah and again like if you have any questions if you look at the materials and have any questions if anything pops up we're here to help we mean that we're an email away um, we're always happy to help. I think we're right on our exact time. How perfect is it? I know we started a little bit late, but. Uh... And we do love comments in our inbox. Um, so you, if you uh, ever want to just write to civics and say, I did that even one sentence, we'd love to hear back. Yeah. And feedback too. Um, we're yeah. always happy if you have comments, criticisms, any kind of feedback, we're always happy to hear it. We're constantly improving and updating the resources. So, and we really take feedback seriously. Um, well, Jessica, there's a question for you about grade six. Yeah, grade six to eight. We have heard from teachers. So it is built for kind of grade seven and up, but we have heard from teachers that have done it. I mean, actually as low as like grade three, I think that's taken a lot of work on their part. We are building um, an, a, a version of this, these materials that are suitable for younger grades. Um, some teachers, I don't know, Christina, you might be better positioned, but some teachers have done it with grade sixes and it has worked, but I'm not sure if they had any secrets that they deployed in order to make it work. Um, I know they've done it. I don't know them personally, but I do know teachers who have used it in grade six. Um, yeah. Oh, you're welcome. That's the, uh, that's our Twitter handle. So if you're looking for at civics, you have to do the underscore Canada. Um, so I just put that in the chat and yes, I think you could, you can use it for grade six. It's, you know, recommended for seven to 12, but give it a try. Let us know how it goes. <laughs> Some of the examples are, yeah, are more specific yeah. than other ones too. And when we do the elementary version, we'll also be rolling out, like we know the examples are really important. So, um, you know, in the works is kind of having the examples such that they're kind of labeled as like beginner, intermediate or advanced. So like a lot of it is just about the kind of the examples that you, that you work with too. And we have other materials that are appropriate for younger grades too. We didn't get into the other, but the newsliteracy.ca site has, um, plenty of other activities on it, including a, um, an online interactive that also teaches lateral reading, but in a more contained environment. It's all like an, an, a social media feed emulating game. Um, so no live internet use on that one, which I know teachers of students in younger grades often appreciate not, not having to send students onto the live internet, which can be a weird place um, in order to research stuff. It's so that it's called fake out. That's something that 
um, you know, might be of interest to people teaching younger students too. Um, and again, if anybody, if you poke around that site and have any questions, even about things we didn't talk about today, happy to, to pick up that conversation after this too. And Tracy, thanks for contributing that about going slower with grade sixes. So you have used it with grade six students, but you've just uh, taken a little bit of time. Yeah, we do hear a lot like vocabulary support becomes important with the younger grades, like some of the, the, the mic videos, you know, have some big words in them and some of the, the terminology is advanced. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. This is really exciting to see so many people out to. <laughs>